Re-fermenting culture. A return to insight through gut logic. Written and read by Patrick Jones on Jajarun Country. Dedicated to Meg Ullman, Radical Fermenter. Beginning the story. In the creation of the world according to the ancient Greeks, Zeus calls upon Prometheus to distribute to the animals their characteristic traits and qualities. Prometheus's twin brother, Epimetheus, becomes envious of the task and demands that he instead does the job. Prometheus agrees, and so Epimetheus hands out all the traits to the animals that are in his pot. However, this vessel soon becomes empty, and there is still one animal who hasn't been given a quality. Man. On hearing that his forgetful brother had botched the creation, Prometheus steals fire from the craft and industry god Hephaestus to give to man so that he will no longer suffer on earth eating raw food and shivering with cold. But Zeus had no plans for mortals to possess fire and punishes Prometheus, chaining him to a rock where his cut and come again liver is torn out daily by an eagle. Later, Heracles will slay the bird and release Prometheus. In the meantime, Zeus has asked Hephaestus to sculpt from clay Pandora. She is to be the first woman who Zeus proposes Epimetheus marry. Pandora comes to the union with a large brewing jar of all gifts. Foresightful Prometheus warns his forgetting brother not to open the jar as he believes it is filled with evils that Zeus has put inside it. However, Pandora, as the poet Hesiod will come to frame, opens it, and all evils, harsh pain and troublesome diseases which give men death are unleashed upon the world. In Pandora, Hesiod claims, is the deadly race and tribe of women who live amongst mortal men to their great trouble and thus begins the West's lineage of misogynistic narration, writ large and rewritten over and over, regressing from paganism to monotheism to consumerism, still shaping the world today. Pandora was framed by a particular kind of writing, words that were cloned and catapulted into the heart of Western culture. The shift from gender-distributed Greece to a gender lopsidedness is possibly older than Hesiod, but he is a startlingly obvious beginning point, 2,700 years ago. The purpose of this work is to reappear Pandora's meaning and reveal how she offers us a possibility, a re-fermenting of culture. In other cultures, in parallel matriarchal stories, Pandora's jar contained ferments used to praise and grieve life in ceremony and festival. It could be argued that due to Hesiod's cultural husbandry as made concrete in his theogony and work and days, the establishing patriarchy was more confident to reframe the story of the first woman. Pandora became the reason men suffer. After letting loose pestilence, famine, disease and death from her jar. Pandora's all-giving narrative transitioned from insight through plant sentient inebriation, fermentation, cure and preservation to hangover and illness. The only good effect of her new misogynistic form was hope. It was the only thing left in the jar after all the evils of the world had escaped. Insight to the backstory. Pandora's once freely organising yeasts, essential for wild fermentation, are now highly controlled and isolated strains, freeze-dried, packaged and put under economic lock and key. They are another case of autonomous, all-giving life being monetized and industrialized, so we get the same flavours, the same predictable outcome. Hesiod's anti-Pandoran texts survived where others did not, 
and were called upon as the official theology by the classical Greek patriarchy. This lineage of hatred seems part of the West's self-loathing tendency. After paganism, Eve gets the same treatment as Pandora. The West's two primary creation myths predate misogynistic societies, but as men began to institutionalise anti-sensible thought, stories got reworked. The cosmology shifted from an acceptance that life was unpredictable and the flow of gifts between people and the living world would ensure a close labouring relationship with such unpredictability to one where all the evils of the world which women brought into existence could be controlled through Promethean tools, Platonic institutions and later Pastorian science. The lack of relationship with the creation trio of the West's most revealing myth has significant ramifications. Pandora embodies insight from the nourishment of the flowering, fibrous earth, fermented, cooked, and given to the original place of human intelligence, the gut. Prometheus, in his ability to perceive or plan the future, for his foresight of mind, and for bringing us fire to transform food through cooking into godlike energy, and his foolish brother Epimetheus, he of heart in love with Pandora, important for understanding through the benefit of hindsight. He is the fool who holds the possibility for wisdom, for the transformation of mistake into learning. Now rebranded as global development, Western imperialism believes it has killed off the hindsight twin, and as a result, we no longer have the checks and balances or feedback loops that Epimetheus' story begs. We have silenced the forgetting hindsight god of our most revealing myth. He is no longer a warning, a precaution, a measure, a wise fool to behold and pose the question, is this technology suitable? Is it necessary? Our predicament as a people comes from the foregrounding of Prometheus, the backgrounding of Epimetheus, and the negation of Pandora as evil seductress. This is the world in which we live, the dominant control ideology of the West, transported and militarised into every reach, every culture. The pasteurisation, drugging, and bulldozing of Pandora's healing gut story, and the forgetting of Epimetheus, our precautionary principle, the God who is there to warn us technology, although a form of memory, is also a form of forgetting. This leaves only Prometheus at the table, total mastery, total mind. Part God, part mortal, the union of Pandora and Epimetheus is revealing. We are mortal animals with godlike abilities to transform our world into cities. But if the city is Promethean only, then Gail Thomas is prudent to propose that the city denies its heart and ignores its stomach. For foresight requires the company of insight and hindsight. The absence of one negates the other. Understanding the biochemistry of decaying grain, fruit or root, water and freely organising yeasts accorded the first ferments, which in turn became gifts bestowed on humankind to aid the grieving and praising of life. For fermentation is intimately connected, writes Stephen Harrod Boona, speaking specifically about ancient healing beers, to travelling in sacred realms. And it's political too, he continues. The normal range of human consciousness and the behaviour that derives from it has never been so narrowly defined as in our time. This narrowing process, an attempt to provide a safety net not inherent in life itself, is becoming ever more extreme. Depression, says Martin Prechtel, is a lack of grief. Grief is rage that don't want to have a home. It is unpredictable and must be left to run its course. Prechtel writes of Chitu Hio initiation for young men at the time of leaving their mothers and desiring others. Before initiation, he writes, 
Most men try to feel that young hollowness, that empty place carved by the fire flood of desire with something that will continue the flood, trying to fill the hole with more of what made it hollow. That hollowness is death itself, and it is in death's kingdom that the root of all possibility and beauty resides. Desire, he continues, after explaining how, as a part of his initiation, a boy must try to steal his mother's prime cooking pot, is death's shovel, and digs the hole where one's heart once beat. The stealing of the supreme tool of the mother, the vessel of life, which is used daily to nourish and give cooked up energy to the family, is so distressing for everyone that the boy will never steal again, never bring about such suffering to kin or community. But the stealing of the pot is his first dug hole of hollowness, of separating. It is his own breaking of the bonds with that most loved of beings in order to journey from boy to man. However, in Chutuhil society, he is not alone. His grief is supported by his fellow initiates, mentors and elders, and the whole village including his mother, despite her great suffering, anger and loss. If a young man should attempt to fill that holy hollowness, Prechtel continues, with alcohol, food, women, fighting, war, ruthlessness, business or anything else that resembles the delicious, inebriating quality of that first hole dug into his life by desire and death, then he will always be courting death. He will probably either find his death or begin destroying things. Pandora offers us ferments brewed in her earthen jar as either delicious inebriation to enrich and praise life and be claimed by our grief and the living of things, or, and this is where Epimetheus's cultural absence is so revealing, as a death wish of substance abuse, forever draining the jar. The global economy, predicated on depletion, is exactly this, forever draining the jar of the giving, flowering, fruiting, fibrous earth, but rarely involved in giving back. Instead, once empty, the jar is thrown away and a new one made, so that today islands of floating plastic sludge exist, very slowly breaking down, not into a life-giving brew, but into a toxic soup killing all in its wake. An empty jar is unthinkable to the world's richest one billion homo citizens. Choosing to go without has become immoral. Bottled water epitomizes this. By contrast, our elegant and strange old mentors, writes Prechtel, not only instructed the boys how to momentarily rob their mothers of their supreme handcrafted vessel, but then, after this was accomplished, they moved on to teaching the boys how to be drunk. They taught them how to be drunk on the alcohol made from the flowering earth itself, while longing for the love of the goddess. In other words, how to be drunk without filling the hole. In this way, one kept from becoming a drunk. How stories come forward. In the performance practice of Artist's family, of which I am one of a number of household players, fermentation is an everyday alchemical relationship with the original Pandora. To us, she is gut intelligence, pre and probiotic, insight, fermenter, symbiotic culture maker, all giver. We have established a shrine to Pandora in our home, which we call the fermenting table, and nothing whatsoever upon it is under lock and key. Here, there are few expectations, just relationships with the invisible, autonomous, sometimes explosive ecologies of our home place. Mothers, or SCOBIES, which stands for Symbiotic Communities of Bacteria and Yeast, reproduce autonomously and are gifted out of the house into many other homes, just as they have been gifted in. By taking in these alive foods, whose origin points we know intimately through our labours, we now understand the gut-stemming anxieties of the West at work. 
the constantly unsettled, gluten intolerant, Crohn's, colitis, IBS, leaky gut pathologies of Platonic, Promethean and Pasteurian institutions and other representatives of the West's monocultural smothering of the intuitive, unpredictable, enigmatic intelligence of Pandora's unwritten chthonic insight, the underworld of the gut. In our family, I make the daily beer, cider, fire water and slow fermented sour breads with young permi folk that we call swaps, which is an acronym that stands for social warming artists and permaculturalists who come to live with us. We sensitively collect wood from the near forest in wheelbarrows to heat our home and water, cook our meals, dry clothes, dehydrate wild mushrooms, weeds and herbs, and keep the conditions right for the proliferation of beneficial microbes. Meg makes the milk kefir and raw milk cheeses, cultured butter, yogurt, kvass, meads, sauerkraut, jun, vinegars, lacto-pickles, rejuvelac, and her special wintertime medicinal brew she calls Mistress Tonic, which is our household's flu shot, which again is not under lock and key. Each with their own chemistry and set of life-giving ecologies, each performing as currency, as gifts to exchange for things we require from others. Nothing we consume in our home is pasteurised. Very little requires money. Nothing comes through an abattoir. The little meat we eat has been killed by cars or hunted, fished, grown and killed by ourselves or friends. We are neo-peasants who apply permacultural principles to our home and community economies, to further become accountable mammals of place. And this constitutes our practice of art, our culture making, and our corporal forms of feminism. When Blackwood, Woody, was finally taken from within Meg, which was quite a procedure after a planned home birth went awry, our tears commingling, holding onto life together, we were relieved by two things. That Promethean science enabled a hospital and a car for the day and that Epimetheus and Pandora were there too in equal measure. Pandora operating through our midwife Sally's care and wild pharmacopoeia knowledges, and in Meg's abundant and health-filled bodily microbiomes. Epimetheus was present in the form of my reluctance to let the institution push us around as our precautionary principle, despite feeling like the fool that the institution was obliged to endure. Woody was so deeply engaged in his birth canal and for quite some time that it would have been impossible for him not to have received his handed down kit of immunity microbials stored in the underworld of his mother's vaginal microbiome. If we had rushed to hospital three days earlier when we observed myconium in his waters and given over to the fear-mongering arena of an institution that must demean the intuition of patients he would not have received his wild Pandoran gifts. When he was born, I was struck by a thick caking of substances on his crown, and I knew without science lab, medical degree or microscope, he was delivered by all three gods and the many others who have followed our peoples in travelling succession from far and wide. Today, Woody is a child brimming with health and happiness, and a considerable part of this story is because of his active role in producing our homegrown and fibre-rich food, which he daily feeds into his serotonin-rich gut. But his vitality is as much to do with his original engagement with cultured life, with his indigenous maternal microecology, handed down mother-ancestor to mother-ancestor, contiguous with his handed-down autonomous health of his home-birthed older brother Zephyr, born in the small house I built with my own poet hands. Zephyr is the reason artist as family came to be. It was his seven-year-old spirit running down the wallaby track from home, jumping over fallen trees, hopping across the wombat creek, scaling the rock face with daring skill and arriving at our lunch spot, only to reassemble the forest's ground stones into little worlds of imagining with his stepmom Meg. This beautiful biophysicality and simple play was a long way from the invitation I'd just received to apply for an artist in residence. 
At the time, photographs of the Pacific trash Gaia were circulating around the internet. What is art's role, I was asking myself, in a culture permissive of its toxic disposability? Coupling Zeph's exuberance, hope and liveliness, and Meg's and my growing understand of just how bad things had become, I proposed a residency as a family beach holiday where the three of us would spend 17 days foraging food and drink packaging along the beaches, ocean cliffs and throughout the city of Newcastle in New South Wales. The work itself was a durational treasure hunt, our first performance as a collective, hauling bag after bag of plastic waste and aluminium cans into the cultural centre that was hosting us as part of This Is Not Art Festival. In 17 days, we amassed a monumental pile of what I now call unproductive death, as a cultural mirror reflecting back onto the Promethean-only city that had produced it, that had allowed it to be. With Woody, now five years old, as her eager apprentice, Meg passionately tends the fermenting table set up in our kitchen where things go gas and glug and perform age-old rituals. While Woody is an enthusiastic advocate and student of fermented foods and drinks, his ten-year-older brother has reached a ripening age where for the moment sugary drink and food are more seductive to put into and extirpate his gut. Seth finds money, works jobs for, and has even stolen, as I did at his age, to supply his habit of lab chemicals and refined monocultural sugars. Products augmented by con men with big budget campaigns that target the young in a manner not too dissimilar to how the archetypal child predator operates, undermine parents, caregivers and elders, seduce with cheap treats, groom with tantalising images, prime to exploit. For a culture of uninitiated people, there are many holes that need to be filled and fires to be lit and the people who dedicate themselves to making money prey on this. Zephyr's initiation process, as it has been painfully, lovingly, and almost ineffectively curated by me and nurtured through many community friends, helps to counter the pervasive admin, and Zephyr is growing up learning that despite his weakness for gloss, brands, sugar, and other poison gifts, no one can make choices on his behalf. The harm he commits to himself and to others is part of a separating process within a culture that leaves initiation to the internet and big business and a culture that has all but lost its eldership. For artist as family, Pandora is a goddess. She brings praise into our home and sings health into our living through her ferments contiguous with her and our grief. We feed her our walked-for and garden fruits, avoiding as much as possible the rampant spread of glyphosate, and she returns us brewed gifts from the forests, streets and gardens we tend. It is Pandora who provides for the transmission of beneficial microbes from mothers to their children at birth, and provides not just beer, but all the brewed-up gifts of the body and home place that flow in unregistered regard. She is the possibility of wild life and wild death, the shaman who fights certainty and sterility and brings us resilience, insight and hope. Zero, the fifth member of Artista's family, came home with us one day as a timid, quivering little sack of skin and bones. He slept with us every night for seven months until he rose out of this attachment into the tough little man-dog he is today. This sweet, intuitive, rough-coated barker, a hunter of rats and rabbits, and more than anything, familial love-giver, produces some of our best medicine. As he has never eaten commercial dog food, his healing dog lick serum is a gift to the whole family. Our life way of radical biology enters and is entered by all domains. When I am with Meg, 
and we have had a glass of wine that I yearly ferment with wild yeasts and grapes that grow on the back of the town's public library that permaculture friends planted 20 years ago. My mouth is awash with love of both the private and intimate and of community togetherness. No one in our house washes very often. The boys, well, because they're boys and we're not pedantic parents. We adults, just occasionally, as we're adamant water conservers, and have come to a neo-peasant realisation that it's not necessary to wash any more than is required, which for us is about once a fortnight. In summer we sweat with our labours and swim at the lake, where we fish for redfin on dusk. In winter we run an occasional bath or cook out cold-seasoned toxins in our rough-cut, wood-fired outside sauna we've dubbed the cookhouse, throwing a bucket of cold water over us in near-snow conditions to complete the ritual. It is the little places of hawthorn and ringtail dray, the secreted, grown over, left alone mushroom and rabbit places of blackberry and native cherry that have called us home. For home has become the flow of gifts between enigmatic entities, neighbours, friends, swaps, community others, old timers, newcomers, and the many communities of the living in the near forest. Life in this emplacing and old timer tree world isn't an ideological polarisation of good and bad species. All is food, all is labour, all is relationship and all is gift. All is life willing more life, making and taking more life to make more of it possible. This is births and deaths possibility. This is their relatedness. For our mortality offers something special. The will to make more life possible to be part of an ecological succession, to be instrumental in making the earth flower and fruit again and again. Afterwards, on the way to a summary. For Artista's family, culture is the capturing of death in delicious inebriation. To behold or hold up the short, brilliant moments, grief and praise in the same intoxicating and unpredictable instances. There is no expectation here, no certainty, no holding on to the moon. Culture is fermentation, composting, humus and poem making, thought distilled and triggered from the gut. For the gut is where the logic of inherent knowing dwells knotted with grief and consternation, or becalmed and affirming. Through Pandora we embrace uncertainty, we roll with her exquisite ambiguity and grace, and familiarise ourselves with her autonomous forageable foods as much as cultivate a permaculture. Displacement may come soon enough. Our resilience is our near ground art and craft. This is Promethean jug holding Pandoran brew, given to we drinking Epimethean fools to tell and retell the grieving, praising, slow ground stories after Martin Shaw of our transition away from what Deborah Bird Rose calls man-made mass death and on again towards the flowering, fruiting, feminine earth, its beauty and its darkness. It is our intention that our children will leave home knowing how to turn waste into useful things, how to repair and service their means of mobility, how to build small temples of eloquence and regard, how to capture and store energy and water, how to grow, preserve and ferment food, how to fish, snare, hunt and make tools for such retrieving, how to steward their local environments and share their knowledges with community friends, and those who need or ask for help. Despite what they become, where their adult interests will lie, they'll be prepared to adapt to whatever their future brings, to become adults not focused on money and property and polluting entertainments, but on caring for the health of all the living. They will leave home having heard from their parents the imperatives of keeping the gods, the fermentation entities, of their intimate walk lands, nourished on the biophysical gifts of their own making, 
the imperatives of speaking with eloquence and without war, but not in sentences that roll over and with ease enable unjustness or a dwelling within blind hope or expectation. After two decades of work, where, from the vista of Epimethean hindsight, I see how I have clumsily put myself through an initiation of sorts, formed and been formed by my community, where I play a role of labouring, gifting and receiving, I have come to understand that culture is the propensity to sing more life into life and to nurture the operations and ecologies that make this possible. In all our neo-peasant activities and Pandoran brews that call us home to what Prechtel calls our indigenous soul, we can become again ecological performers of culture. What I have learnt in this time is when we return to a loved home place where the animate and vegetal have burrowed deep into our being, we begin to sense the possibilities of lasting peace. If we return to peace, for the idea that humankind is only destructive and opportunistic is a fallacy promulgated by storytellers preying on our most imperialist instincts, we would have arrived through the stories we are telling our children the visions they and we have as we fall asleep each night. If our minds have no peace, peace has no agency. I sense now that the flow of gifts established between such gods, the hawthorn, wood bluet, rabbit, chickweed and wild apple gods, to name a few, are entities who go from forest and garden to gut microbiome and back to the earth again as life-giving humanure, potash, activated biochar, nitrogenous urine, mushroom spore, and humus mimicking compost. Because we already participate in the flow of such gifts, we know the possibilities for such economy. Enabling the grounds to re-establish sacred economies will encourage the possibility of regenerating and re-fermenting cultures that are once again abundant, given to, and at peace. Despite how unfit we are as a people to create such culture, these worlds are possible. It will take many more folk to dedicate their lives to abundance and gifting as their primary economic and social motivations, replacing the depletion, extraction and unproductive death ideologies of the global economic monoculture. And we will have to adapt with far less affluence and with climate instability. The change required in us will need to occur from the gut up. Thought in mind, without fibrous fermentation, is superfluous for the changes now imperative for culture. We can no longer put poisons in our food and expect to be nourished and ready to heal. Understanding the all-giving of microbiome health may well return us the required insight to heal the biomes of the world and help revive our culture's all but lost spirit for renewal. For this is the story of Pandora, the goddess. Her presence is the possibility of death's gift, fermentation. It is she who honours the multifarious cultures of decay from which renewal springs, a culture that has lost its beginning story is a culture adrift, destructive and self-harming. While the West can be seen as synonymous with imperialism, this is not our old people, this is not our true culture. Gender lopsidedness is not our only heritage. We were all Pandoran, all giving, and we can be so again. Oh, great opposition of the world Two old willows with a joy. The silver two fields, a 
Michelle Degee Composti, sung and arranged by Patrick Jones. That's me. If you'd like to find out more about Artist as Family, head to our social media at Artist as Family.